Liebert review Arnold Schwarzenegger as a top Soviet cop and James Belushi as his American partner in the action thriller Red Heat. Barbara Hershey stars as a journalist against apartheid in a world apart. And creatures from beyond return to haunt a... Schwarzenegger is a Russian legend and James Belushi is a Chicago slob, but they're both cops and they team up in Red Heat, one of the five new summer movies we're going to be reviewing this week. I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. And I'm Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune. Our first film is called Red Heat and it's a cop picture made by Walter Hill who paired a convict with a cop chasing a killer in the great movie 48 Hours. Now here we get a Russian cop, Arnold Schwarzenegger, working with a Chicago cop, as Roger said, James Belushi, as the Russian is on the tail of a Russian drug dealer. Here's where the two cops trade lines after Schwarzenegger arrives in Chicago and as Belushi's regular partner looks on. Nothing hotter than Chicago in August. It's the humidity that gets to you. Humidity, you know. Moisture in the air. How's it been in Moscow? Bob. No moisture. Where do you learn to speak English so well? Army. Compulsory training. Language school in Kiev. Oh, yeah. That's like uh, as in chicken Kiev. Well, you can see Belushi is really second banana here, and the same is true when Schwarzenegger confronts the drug dealer who's temporarily behind bars. Goodbye. You tell their old buddies. The body language is a beautiful thing, isn't it? Naturally, there are action scenes, and as with most Schwarzenegger movies, it's on a big scale as the two cops chase the drug dealer. What are all the cops? Damn, they never around when you need one, you know that? You make a use of them all over your ass. chases, they all start to run together in my mind. Red Heat has a few funny lines, but Schwarzenegger is so stone-faced in this picture, and Belushi gets so little chance to expand his character that Red Heat has no human value. As for the action, well, the same kind of hallway shootouts that were handled so well by Walter Hill in 48 Hours, they're not handled as well in this picture. For all of the noise, Red Heat is rarely exciting. I guess I liked it uh, more than you did. I think there were more than a few funny lines, and I thought that a lot of them keyed off the fact that Schwarzenegger was stone Face. I think the whole point here of this character, whose nickname is Iron Jaws, is that right. he has no sense of humor and he doesn't see the humor in anything. And here's Belushi, who's always wisecracking or sees the angles on things or is making little right. asides of his own. And that tension is what makes it funny. If Schwarzenegger okay. were more no. malleable and more more bending, then it wouldn't be as funny. Roger, you have just given what the, is, in effect, the story pitch for the idea. We'll have a stone faced guy and we'll have a guy who's more flamboyant. I uh -huh. knew that that was the intention. Oh, I'm saying the execution of that uh -huh. is not very good. Good. Belushi, the movie is cut and edited to much more towards Schwarzenegger. He's the big star, mm -hmm. and Belushi just gets to lob his lines in. If there had been more interplay, if he had put down Schwarzenegger more, if the balance had been shifted more towards Belushi and Schwarzenegger had taken a little bit of some more, some more subordinate role, I think the picture would have been more well, What you're doing is you're attending the story conference and telling how you'd fix my basic That's exactly. pitch. You got but it. But I don't think that I agree with you because I like Schwarzenegger's performance here. I like the Russian accent, and I like the fact that he's not playing the basic Schwarzenegger character. I, I think he's playing a duller Schwarzenegger character than he's ever played before. Okay. Okay, next movie, and our next movie is an impressive achievement, not only because it paints a dramatic and angry portrait of South Africa, which it does, but also because it isn't just about politics. 
This movie is about the love between a South African mother and daughter and the way that that love is threatened by the pressures of a dangerous time. The name of the movie is A World Apart and it stars Barbara Hershey in an electrifying performance as a woman who has dedicated her life to the fight against the apartheid system. The movie takes place in 1963 when police raids on racially mixed gatherings have become commonplace. May I see your warrant? This is a warrant for the arrest of Gus Roth. He's not here. I'm surprised, Mrs. Roth. You're having a party with that thing? It's her birthday. Will you just take a look around? I don't need a warrant, Mrs. Roth, to charge you under Section 94 of the Prohibition of Intoxicating Liquor Act, which prohibits the supply of alcoholic <laughs> beverages to blacks. Do you see anyone here with a drink? A young actress named Jody May gives an unforgettable performance as Hershey's daughter. She's like other typical white South African kids, except that blacks are treated as equals in her home. I'm Solomon Mabuza. This is Sipo Lamene. I'm Elsie's brother. Kefitcha, are you the one who's been in jail? <laughs> yes. Come on, Molly, let's play the game! Hey, Molly! Come to the house. As the South African government begins to crack down on dissent, the family's maid, played by Linda Mavusi, receives some shattering news. And here's a dramatic scene as police arrive to put Hershey under a 90-day detention. You're not going to take the address book. You can't take that. It's got the telephone numbers of our doctor, our dentist, all the children's there are friends. names and numbers of banned people in there, Mrs. Roth. For God's sake, I'm a journalist. Look. Diana, what's happening? They're arresting me. Oh, no. It's 90 days. Oh, my God. And you can see in the eyes of that little girl the buried theme of this movie, which is that although her mother is involved in this great cause, from the little girl's point of view, she just wants to know why she doesn't get more love and attention. And her father has already fled the country because he fears of being jailed. The screenplay for A World Apart was written by Sean Slovo, and she based it on her own childhood in South Africa. That mother is based on her. That's her mother, a political activist. What's interesting about the movie is that it's told so completely from the point of view of that 13-year-old girl who resents the fact that her mother overlooks and ignores her in the midst of this political turmoil. This is the best movie I've seen about the situation in South Africa. It's the movie that Cry Freedom should have been, and it won the special jury prize at this year's Cannes Film Festival, as well as acting awards that were shared by all three actresses, by Hershey, May, and Mavusi. It's one of the year's best films. I think it's a very fine film. It's certainly better than Cry Freedom. Uh, the point, I think, is that they went small. They, they went personal. Cry Freedom went on a big scale. I happen to like it more than you did. But this film goes small, and that's the secret. I think if you're going to handle a big cause, people know that, what the cause yeah. is. It's obvious. You don't have to sell that. What you have to do is tell it from a fresh perspective. And so we have this extraordinary performance by this young girl, uh, Jody Sorry, May. Mm -hmm. And then you have Barbara Hershey, quite magical. This, uh, here's an actress. We did a show recently on her as someone who never lets us down. And she hasn't, she hasn't here. Again. This is great work, not in the sense of fulminating work, but controlled work. Yes, She's playing a very tight, nervous, controlled woman who's trying to be an activist and keep it secret and hold her family together. She does, she a, does a good, good job, job of it. I think you're right that it takes it small. For example, there's a funeral in this film. Yes. It's on a smaller scale, but it's much, much more effective right. than the big millions of extras funeral in Cry I think Freedom. that's such an important this lesson. This film was directed by Chris Minges, right. who was the cinematographer of Killing. The Killing Field and The Mission. And what's right. interesting is that having shot those big widescreen epics, he now, in his first movie as a director, tells this human story that really puts the South African situation into understandable terms. I think terms. it was a very smart decision. Go small with a big cause. Coming up next, Ricky and Pete featuring a character just as offbeat as Crocodile Dundee, and also coming up, Poltergeist 3, as the demons return again to terrorize a little girl. Through surprise, a little comedy from Australia called Ricky and Pete.
This is far more interesting than either of the Crocodile Dundee pictures, if you ask me, even the first one, especially if your taste is slightly more adult. Ricky is a geologist who moonlights as a singer, and she enjoys her offbeat brother Pete, who gets his kicks with vengeful practical jokes on the Melbourne Police Department. That's when he's not delivering papers with one of his weird mechanical inventions. Not a bad device. Impractical, <laughs> won't get a lot of papers delivered, but at least it looks good in the movie. After an argument with their conservative father, Ricky and Pete leave their wealthy home and head into the Australian outback in the family Bentley. Eventually, they settle in a mining community where Pete builds another mechanical device to help Ricky's mining efforts. Meanwhile, Ricky has her own ideas how to silence some of the skeptical friends. Our next is Miss Bonnie Oakley. Ricky, we were only yoking! That was I! Hey, Pete, next time you better get yourself one that's broken in, eh? What's so wonderful about this picture is not only are the leads interesting, but there are a bunch of wonderful supporting characters in film, including an angry police sergeant in Melbourne. Now, we've seen this guy, the cop, being frustrated. But you, see, you saw it in uh, Jackie Gleason playing it and Smokey and the Bandit. This guy is more funny than that. Uh, he stalks Pete across the desert. There's also this whole mining town full of free spirits and goofy spirits, a tough junk dealer who uh, quotes some outrageous prices, but... The, most of all, I guess it is the lead characters of Ricky, who is memorable when singing, and Pete, who is a classic loner, whose head is turned finally by an Asian woman living in the mining community. This is the film that I think is really an advertisement for Australia, because it looks like most every character in the film is trying to have a good time in this strange and wonderful land. They do, and we do. You know, Gene, with all the best goodwill in the world, I just finally can't vote thumbs up on this film, and it's exactly the kind of film that I generally support. A little slice of life with strange, weird characters doing bizarre and eccentric things uh, in an unusual environment. I love films like this, but I finally just didn't like this one because it just lacked the energy, especially in the last hour. You talk about that police sergeant chasing them across the desert. It just cuts back to him again and again as he's long. biting his mustache. But Roger, it doesn't cut back to him for long amounts oh, of times like a worse film would have. go anywhere. And at oh. the end of the movie, I just felt, gee, you know, they, had, they have very original characters here. They have an interesting premise. What they didn't have was the energy to really crank it up to the point where it could be truly comic instead of simply whimsical. Well, I'll tell you this, I never expected the ending of the film, not that it's any great shakes, because I think this film is about character, and I think character can be quietly surprising and enjoyable. I didn't know that the, the film was going to end the way it did, and I don't think you did either. It was quietly surprising and enjoyable, but too quietly surprising oh, boy, and enjoyable. That is Next. strange. Red Heat, you like them bludgeoned over the head. Thank you. Next at the movies, they're back, and they've taken over Chicago Skyscraper in Poltergeist 3. Karen! The light! The light! Our next movie is named Poltergeist 3, and this is one of those movies you cannot possibly endure if you have even the smallest shred of common sense. Not that if you had such a shred, you would have gone to the movie in the first place. Correct. Poltergeist 3 takes place inside Chicago's John Hancock skyscraper, where little Carol Ann, played by the late Heather O'Rourke, has gone to stay with some relatives while undergoing psychological testing, which seems necessary after her experiences in the first two movies. In fact, the audiences of those movies could probably use the same tests. Right. The evil Poltergeist follow her there and put on a demonstration of their power. When you talk about things that bother you, they go away. No, if you talk about things, they happen. Who told you that? Go away! <laughs> Most of the scenes in the movie take place inside the Hancock building where Carol Ann's cousin and the cousin's boyfriend 
try to rescue Carol Ann from sudden danger when a bottomless pit opens up in the parking garage. Tom Skerritt stars as the girl's uncle, and he's there when the missing boyfriend suddenly reappears from the frozen swimming pool. The ice in the... You always wonder how the tennis committee likes it when the building where they own a condo is trashed in a movie like this. I hope they got free tickets. I hope they didn't. Now, I said you couldn't sit through this movie if you had any common sense. Well, why not? Well, because the following things take place inside the Hancock building. Whole apartments become filled with snow and ice. Corridors are filled with steam. The parking garage and the swimming pool freeze over. Several cars explode and turn the garage into a roaring inferno. You saw the bottomless pit. The sprinkler system floods the place. The elevators race up and down like yo-yos. Windows are broken, and yet at no point do any policeman or any fireman ever turn up, nor does any of this ever make the papers. Amazing. In fact, nobody seems to notice How about it. repairs? Exactly. The screenplay for this movie is also amazing because it makes a serious tactical error. It uses too many scenes in which the characters incessantly cry out for oh, each other. Yes. Carol Ann! Carol Ann! Bruce! Bruce! Patricia! Patricia! Carol Ann! Bruce! Finally, the, the night that I saw it, even the audience was joining in. Carol Ann! Carol Ann! Bruce! I mean, you I must it. have heard the you name Carol Ann yes. a thousand times. Now, I'm disappointed. I'm, I'm pleased that you... We're getting into the dynamic of this show. I'm pleased <laughs> that you were smart enough to pick up on Carol Ann. Thank you very but much. But I was hoping that you wouldn't, because I was all going to do my Carol Ann imitations. Oh, good. And so well, I have to That will be denied because that. Because I was saying there, I wonder how many times the name Carol Ann is set in this movie. My guess, you guess, just in a sec, think, 100? 100? A hundred times I heard the name up Carol down, Ann. Up and down Carol the staircase. Ann. Carol Ann. The scene, Skerritt goes up. Carol, Carol Ann, Ann, Carol Ann, Carol Ann, as he goes Carol up. Ann. Then behind him is, is uh, Nancy Allen, his, his uh, wife. Bruce, 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 as she look, goes up. How then about comes, this? Why couldn't they just have said one time in the movie as a joke, Carol, I would have loved that. The movie stinks. Wouldn't have been that great of a joke either. Coming up next, Wings of Desire. A couple of angels come to Earth, and one angel decides he sort of likes it here. I can't see you, but I know you're here. I feel it. Next film is called Wings of Desire, and it's an inspired variation on the old story of angels visiting Earth. Usually, such films focus on the people living on the planet and how the angels affect their lives. This film gives more than equal time to the angels' thoughts, one of whom begins to wish that he lived on Earth while visiting West Germany. Through the angel, we can hear what people are thinking, even babies. Among the people this angel meets in this most unusual film is Peter Falk, playing essentially himself, an American actor in Germany doing a picture. You've been hanging around since I got here. I wish I could see your face. Just look into your eyes and tell you how good it is to be here. Just to touch something. See, that's cold. I feel good. Here. The smoke. Have coffee. And if you do it together, it's fantastic. That's Bruno Gans as the angel Damiel. The other angel in the movie clashes with Damiel, but the juiciest part of this picture is how close we get to everyday people, their joys, their heartbreaks. Director Vim Venders does a real remarkable thing here. He praises life as it is lived, yet making sense out of life's confusions to the point where we enjoy being alive in a fresh way. I really like this film. I like this movie very, very much. It has a mood to it. It yes. takes the time to establish that mood, and you feel the loneliness of people who are given the power to give a little surcease and a little comfort to living people but who can never live themselves. And you know, 
This movie reminded me of a movie we both liked 10 years ago, Kings of the Road, also yes. by Vim Benders. Two divorced men who hit the road together yep. and drive around aimlessly, talking about how somehow they can't live with women and they can't live without women. Here in this movie, we have two lonely guys, only they're angels, and they're saying, if we, only we knew the secret that these other people have, we wouldn't feel like such outsiders. Well, that's what I'm calling the remarkable element. Mm -hmm. He doesn't sweeten life to the point that it's false. No. But yet, the feeling that one gets is life, warts and all, is what life is about. Mm -hmm. And he takes, uh, he makes us understand that the sting that's there, mm -hmm. the schism that's there, of what we want to be and what we are, is part of being alive. And that's, I the appreciate The bottom that. line of this movie is death is a horrible thing, but it would be better to be able to die than to have to live forever as an, as an angel and never have lived at all. Now let's recap the movies that we reviewed on this program. We disagreed on Red Heat with Arnold Schwarzenegger and James Belushi. The characters weren't special enough for Gene, but I liked its energy. Two thumbs up for A World Apart, the brave and brilliant drama about South Africa with unforgettable performances by Barbara Hershey and young Jody May. A disagreement on Ricky and Pete, the whimsical slice of life from Australia. Gene liked it more than I did. And two big thumbs down for Poltergeist 3. And finally, we both admired Wings of Desire, the story of an angel who yearns to be human. So, A World Apart and Wings of Desire from both of us, two very unusual and very good pictures. And I like Ricky and Pete. Little pictures to see while you can't get in to see the ones that are so big and so popular around town. These are three very good films. Okay. That's it for this week. Next time, we'll be back with two more big summer movies, Who Framed Roger Rabbit? A comic murder mystery that mixes cartoon characters and a very real Bob Hoskins. Also, The Great Outdoors. The pain of summer vacations is explored by Dan Aykroyd and John Candy. That's next week. And until then, the balcony is closed.